but but are you really ready? Uh, Pumped up, dude. Yeah. Is yeah. everybody ready for this? Oh, yeah. Always ready. Oh, yeah, baby. Okay. Born ready. What's up, everybody? This is Stu. Up? That's David. That's Wes. That's Tyler. That's James. This is Filling Storehouse Podcast. And uh, we have an amazing show today for you guys. Uh, I'm pretty fired up about it. David, are you fired up about it? I'm super fired up, dude. Super, super fired up. Super? I, can't even, I can't even say super fired up so fast because I'm so fired up. I'm getting tongue-tied, dude. You're not, that, you're that's not, where I'm at. You're that's not where the smartest I'm at. man in the world. So, you know, these insults are a little bit like, it's almost, it's interesting that you do that because most of our listeners know that um, they probably assume that I'm smarter than you. So when you say I'm not the smartest dude in the world, like it just shows how dumb you are. <laughs> hey, well, this show isn't about us, uh, but uh, this show is about James Tyler and Wes. And um, what uh, what we're hoping to kind of get out of this um, today is um, really talk about, um, we'll highlight, hi- highlight these amazing men. Um, they are all a part of our, of our mastermind group, the War Room Mastermind. And, um, you know, David and I recently uh, had, uh, we, we watched this about a one hour long uh, speech that uh, this author, uh, John Reinhardt did, and um, it's called Gospel Patrons. And he wrote a book about it. Um, and it's really about um, giving and serving, which Every, if, if anyone knows uh, who we are and what this podcast is about, it's about giving and serving. And, and really, um, his, his point is about giving and how can we create an impact in this world um, with what we're doing. And so, um, you know, we, we kind of w- wanted to take this episode and, and highlight uh, some of, uh, you know, James, Tyler and Wes's, uh, the why, the reasoning behind what they're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, s- s- get into it and, um, have some good conversations. So, uh, what I think we'll do is, um, just go kind of go around the horn and, and one, just allow you guys to introduce yourself and then, um, let's kind of get into, you know, who you are and what you're doing all this for. And a couple, a couple of points before we, before we kick off to, uh, just to set the, you know, just to, to set the environment we oftentimes are talking about being intentional with your why developing your why doing self-reflection uh you know investing in yourself and these gentlemen have done all those things and then they took the next step and they turn it they turn it into something right they turn it into action uh they do something with that why that why they use it to drive them and i think that's of utmost importance uh two much less important points one uh, go navy beat army we Amen. are filming. We're filming this on uh, on an Army Navy Day, so hopefully it turns out well, and I won't have to eat those words on Monday. But we <laughs> shall see. And uh, another one, you know, the time of year, you know, you're probably going to hear there's a siren going to go by and Santa Claus is on the back, and it's the time of year that there's a lot of focus on um, on ourselves and the gifts we're going to receive, and our kids are all pumped about Santa Claus and what they're going to get under the tree. And I think it's just a very purposeful time of year as well to to think about how we can be those that bless others how can you be that santa claus how can you be that jesus that other people see because you might be you might be what they see right you might be that example so i think it's a very timely episode and i'm pumped up let's do it let's do this uh, let's do it. so let's start with uh, james um let's start start with you because you're over uh in in another country and uh in the, um serving overseas so let's uh, let's kind of hear your story and who you are yeah absolutely i will warm it up and then hand it over to the heavy hitters when i'm done so this is perfect nice um yep james gray guys uh i am in the united states air force so i know i'm of the minority here um i know we probably have the best golf courses of everybody um that's that's hosted here on the podcast as well but uh, i'm stationed in aviano so northern italy um, we are kind of at the tail end of our second wave of COVID right now. So we, we just got loosened restrictions and my family took that opportunity to run up into the Dolomites. <clears throat> They've been getting dumped on with snow all week. So we just needed to get away, get out of the house, get out of our town and just spend a little bit of time up here. So, uh, I am in a, in a very old Airbnb in the Dolomites right now, which is cool. Um, I'm a father of three. So I've got a nine-year-old son, a seven-year-old daughter, and a four-year-old daughter. 
Um, and then I have been married for 12 years now. So we're almost at 13. Um, my wife and I met in grad school. We spent uh, an entire life before I joined the military doing something prior to me getting in. It was super exciting. We got to travel the world. It was awesome. Set the foundation for ourselves. So um, I am a pilot. I thought about leaving with that. So normally when you're a pilot, you, you do actually just come out and say I'm a pilot. Uh, I also am a Texan. So those two things conflict, right? You never know whether you want to leave wow. with I'm a Texan or I'm a pilot. And I have this internal conflict with that all the time, right? Dude, so, I feel you, man. Um, I have that same exact issue. It's, it's, yeah, it's a problem. So it's, you it's just a challenge. The embarrassment, you like you want to get the embarrassment out first. Is that what the problem no, is? Or? That's pride. I know. I thought that's not this type of meeting right now, but I just had to come out and say, you know, I'm James Gray, I'm a pilot, and I'm a Texan. All right. Boom. So I just got Mike had drop. Throw that out there. <laughs> so um yeah that's that, that's kind of a little bit of, of who i am and and uh and my family and my background um which which is also a, a big engine to to my why so uh, i can get into to more details exactly about about the why the evolution of my why the, my theory behind the why we can talk about all those things right now if you really want to get into the the nitty-gritty behind all that type of stuff but at the end of the day just like what David just said when he was opening this up is that eventually you're at this time of year where you can actually have some self-reflection and hopefully get to a point where your why is not just your why, it's everybody's why. So collectively you're trying to better everything, give back, do something different. So I'm sure as we go around the horn and we do that, we're going to get into some awesome discussions, but that's just a little taste right now. Besides the text and the pilot thing, that's just, just where we're at. But. I love it, man. Yeah. Uh, Tyler, why don't you go next, buddy? Yeah, thanks, Stu. So I'm Tyler Goble. I'm a, uh, so me and David actually have a really strong bond back when he played for Navy and I think it was like the fifties, right? Um, <laughs> so we, we both played linebacker at, uh, the Naval Academy. So today's like a, a sacred day for us when, uh, Navy's going to go on and beat army by at least, I think hundred million is the line, I think for Navy. So <laughs> Yep. Um, 100 million yep yeah yep. <laughs> give or take but uh anyway so me and david that's how i got to know um storehouse 310 was through david's connection with navy football and me just being a uh, meathead just running as fast as i can trying to get some advice and gave david a call one time and he was gracious enough for me to talk his ear off for about an hour and a half or something like that um i'm from michigan originally so i'm not from texas but my wife is so we got that in common, James. All right. My wife's from hey. Waco, Texas. Nice. Yep. Well. And uh, so for me personally, this, this real estate investing journey that I'm on, um, my wife and I do it personally. So we do it with our own, our own money. We invest a lot of it into real estate. Um, we did a fix and flip. We did a live-in rental. Um, we're currently in a quasi um, house hack right now where we're gonna live in this house. And then when I get orders to Virginia, we're gonna rent it out as we leave. Um, currently in Monterey, California. Um, but really our why, it's one of those things where I can see how blessed I've been in my life um, just by the nature of my family. Um, I had a great family growing up, a mom and dad who really loved me, really poured into me. Um, Lindsay had the exact same thing. She had a great mom, great dad poured into her, um, had some really great opportunities in the Naval Academy, um, inarguably the best university in the, in the country. So there's Pretty really statement. no, there's really no way around that yeah. one. Um, and then just my, na my natural, um, bent towards things. So I'm, I'm naturally a guy who likes numbers, who likes seeing long-term growth and that kind of a thing. And we really believe my wife and I, that it'd be a waste if we didn't try and use those gifts and use those blessings to help other people. So for us, our passions in real estate investing, and we really believe that real estate investing is a platform that it's so scalable and it's so abundant that you can, and it's, and it's also something that conveys a message of physical security and hope. Um, and for us, my mother-in-law, she actually started an anti-trafficking organization called Unbound Now. And so what we're doing with our real estate investing business that we, we actually just launched is we're using proceeds from that business to help fund Unbound now um, in their fight against human trafficking. So 
Um, the grand vision is uh, an endowment fund concept. So you guys are all familiar with universities and how they have just oodles and oodles of money somehow because they just get it from their donors or whatever it is. But a lot of times what happens is a university has an endowment fund. And what that is, it's a big pot of money that's invested into other things that produces income for that university and they run operations based off of that. And so what we see in the future is LTG Investments is the name of the company, but what LTG is going to be doing is using real estate to create an endowment fund for nonprofits. So um, in our opinion, the name of the game in real estate is moving as fast as you can to turn that active income into passive income. So whether you're doing stuff from acquisitions, fix and flips, um, syndicating deals, doing stuff like that, taking that money and then getting it to a place to where you no longer have to do it. It's like the classic rich dad, poor dad, getting your money to work for you. And so what we see our long-term vision is that um, imagine with me for a second that you own 10 houses completely free and clear for hundred grand, right? So that's a million dollar house portfolio. Now imagine that those houses are all rentals that cash flow a thousand dollars a month just for good, easy numbers. What that means is now you control a million dollars worth of assets and it produces $120,000 a year in cash flow. To put that into perspective, Unbound Now's budget in Waco, Texas, where my, mo my mother in law works, it's about a $1.2 um, million dollar budget for them, for them to operate each year. And so if you have people like us that are wanting to make a difference and do it in a way that uh, is scalable, I think you guys can kind of connect the dots and see how something like that has the potential to be super powerful, especially when you project it out over the long term. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways that the endowment fund concept, I think, can can be something that's just so scalable and it, it doesn't have to necessarily be with Unbound. So um, there's investors that I'm working with that aren't necessarily wanting to give to Unbound. Maybe they're wanting to give to so-and-so or another charity like the Jolly 33 or something like that. Um, and it's just something that's very scalable. And I think we're, that's why we're so passionate. And so really our long-term vision is just to leverage time, talent, treasure on our end to leverage, to enable those nonprofits to kind of leverage their own time, talent, and treasure. And, uh, so yeah, that's our, that's our big why. And something that's really important, I think to kind of touch on is it's hard work to do this stuff, right? Like, I'm sure you guys, like, what time do you usually wake up, Stu? I wake up, uh, well, my alarm's set for 4 a.m., but uh, normally I've been really getting up at like 3.30 on quite a few occasions just because my brain doesn't shut down. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, also highlight, he's like he's like 85 years old and goes to bed at <laughs> like 7.45 I mean, at night, too. There, there is some truth to that. There, there yeah, are times yeah. where I'm like in the covers by like 8, 8.30, <laughs> lights out. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean... I've found my, my like sweet spot where my brain is on fire and, and that's, that's early AM for me. So that's where I work best. Yeah. If you, if you were just in this like real estate stuff to like make money, do you think it would be pretty hard to tell your wife like, Hey babe, I'm going to go ahead and just wake up at four o'clock in the morning every day just to make this massive pile of money. No, man. No, absolutely like, not. Not, it's not sustainable. Right. It's no. one of those things where if you're not, and then I, I love the concept of this, this episode. It's like, if you're not personally invested in something to where it's more than the money you're making a difference in people's lives, it's not sustainable. So you, you'll see all these, these stories of people making tons of money and they're super fired up, but it's like, man, what are you going to be in 20 years when you've just grinded your soul down to a nub because you've been waking up at 4am and working 15 hour days for 10 years? Like, so for us, it's one of those things where to survive in the long term and really have this make any sort of sense for us as far as um, meaning and, and purpose in life, we're doing this um, and setting the foundation for, for our business with that generosity mindset. Um, because I, if I were to wake up at 4.30 in the morning like you used to every day, and like that's, that's kind of what I do too, and I'm on, I'm on calls with investors, calls with wholesalers at five o'clock in the morning, I think I would have a hard time explaining to my wife, like she wouldn't be bought into it if it was one of those things where it's like, Tyler's just a greedy, like piece of crap because he's just always working. Vice, we have a shared vision, we have a shared why. 
And because of that, we're able to um, kind of understand that there's short-term sacrifices for, for long-term um, meaning behind what we're doing. And yeah, so I, I guess that's it, that's it in a nutshell for, for us it? and my wife. That's, it? that's okay. all. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Next. <laughs> no biggie. No biggie. I love it, man. You, you switched the game up a little bit on us, which is awesome. We'll come back to you, James, uh, after Wes, and you can give us the the breakdown of that why too. But Tyler, awesome dude. Um, love it. And and as we get into the you know further into it, just uh, some of the specifics on on why you know I'd love to talk about what what it is about uh, that specific. Uh, mission that your mother-in-law has. Um, I'm really excited to hear about that too, because I'll tell you what, man, these, these things are, are big, big issues. And, and uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's huge it, changing world, right? Changing the world one life at a time. So it's good stuff. Thank you for sharing that. Wes, what's up, dude? Hey, uh, my name is Wes Rice. Uh, I'm down in San Diego right now. Active duty Marine joined the service in 2003, uh, made the transition over to the officer side in 2014, started in 2011. I am a third generation service member. My grandfather was in the Air Force in the 40s. Uh, father retired from the Navy uh, back in the 90s. And uh, then I, I went and did the logical thing and joined the Marine Corps. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's all been good. I, I am a father been married for about 14 years. I have four boys, uh, 13, 10, four, soon to be five, uh, and then uh, two years old. So we got the... Dang, you're in the mix. We, we got a good group. Yeah. Is there a lot of violence um, in your house? Uh, <laughs> like I have two boys and a girl and the two boys, like the violence level is just so out of control. Yeah, no, it's 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 nuts. Um, I, I think about it this way with with having the first two at such a, an early age for my wife and I, uh, and just with anybody having kids uh, in general, the, those first two, the first one is, is experimental. You're, you're learning everything. You're figuring out how to feed them and all that stuff. And then when you put two of them together, uh, nothing but fights all the time. And uh, I think that gap between number two and three served us well. We were able to mature a little bit and, and cope with it a little bit better. Uh, Fortunately for us, they they kept that stuff out of the, the public eye, so I didn't have to lose my stuff in uh, in the public. But uh, no, it's it's good. And, and I didn't have that growing up. Uh, I didn't have a brother. I had an older sister. Uh, felt I don't know if she ever hears this. I don't. I want to feel like a like I was an only child. But uh, it was different. So I didn't have that that brother bond and. Uh, for having them and, and seeing what they're going through. It's, it's awesome, but yes, violence all the time. Um, but for me, uh, in getting to my why, shortly after making the transition over to the officer side, um, I got diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, it, it is a form of leukemia. Uh, chronic doesn't go away, it is treatable. Um, and you just manage it like any other chronic condition. Um, I have up days, down days, uh, but you learn to, to love them and just move on from there. Um, but yeah, I, I started off uh, on the officer side. I was going the, the pilot route, wanted to fly helicopters. Uh, that quickly got nipped in the bud. Uh, I can get into detail more about that, that path uh, later on, but uh, Ultimately for me, and like I said, I, I got four boys and for anybody who has children, uh, your why, uh, it, it's typically your family. And for me, it's hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. Um, nothing in life is guaranteed, but I'm gonna do everything that I can in whatever time that I have to, to make sure that they're taken care of. So ultimately when that time does come, um, I, I can leave this earth happy and content that that uh, they're, they're going to be better off. But uh, yeah, that's a little bit of it right now. Wes, what I, what I love about, um, you know, the first time we met, you know, I jumped on uh, your, your group call and, and uh, you're just so like open and honest about it, but, but 
this this uh, this mindset of um, hey, it, it's just a little roadblock, like leukemia, no big deal. Like I'm just going to overcome this and keep on pushing and striving forward and um, creating this legacy for my children. And um, I can I can beat leukemia, you know, no big deal. Um, which dude I, I love man and like I was so motivated after that first call with you like I wanted to go like tackle the world so um, I appreciate that man um, it's, it's definitely motivation for me and I, I'm glad that uh, that you were able to jump on this call with us no and I I appreciate being being asked to come in here and talk about it it's I, I talk about it often uh, day to day ever since it it happened um and I guess I'll get into a little bit now yeah. in the past uh, and coming. Um, I, I commissioned a little later in life. I wasn't alone in that regard doing the enlisted time and then coming over to the on the officer side. Uh, but at that point, um, going through uh, what's called the basic school, Navy, Marines, familiar with it. Um, it's six, seven months of training in Quantico for, for Marine officers. Uh, in the winter time, anybody familiar with Quantico, like it's it's a rough place to be in the winter time. Uh, it wasn't fun. Uh, I had the at that point, I, I only had two kids, and uh, we decided to leave them. Uh, I I decided to leave them back home in Washington State with my wife, uh, so we didn't have to pull them out of school. Uh, we figured it was best. I could focus on school, uh, but the problem with that was uh, one, it's a it's a a long and physically demanding uh, course. And I'd say for, for anybody in the military and, and just competitive mindsets, like you don't, you don't do things uh, with the expectation that you're gonna quit. You, you expect it to be hard, uh, but failure is never an option. Um, the problem with that for me was I didn't realize how, how much my health was deteriorating. I didn't realize how much weight I had lost. I didn't realize how thin I was. Uh, and I ignored all the signs and symptoms that like looking back now, and even shortly after being diagnosed with leukemia, I'm like, I was an idiot. And the, the few times where I would like video chat with my wife, uh, she could clearly see that there was something wrong with me. Um, she kept telling me to go to medical, but when you're in that environment, you're like one more day, just I'm not going to medical. I'm not going to, I'm not going to potentially slow this down. I just got to get through here. Um, and mentally I was in a rough spot um, because I had never been used to failure or not performing at the top. And one of the, the requirements for graduating from the basis school is a 15 mile hike. And I had never, I'd, I'd never had any issues with any physical events before and hiking was certainly not one of them. Like I'm a shorter guy. Uh, I got to take more strides, more steps, a little bit quicker, but never had an issue with it. Uh, but for whatever reason, when it, when it came to that hike, I just, I couldn't keep up. Uh, I could keep going, but it just wasn't at a fast enough pace. Um, and ultimately I ended up failing it a couple of times. I, I failed it the first time. Um, failed it the second time when, when they had me remediate, I was going, uh, on the weekends, after working hours, trying to, to hike. And I felt like a, a fool putting on all my gear and walking out there on the road by myself when everyone's out uh, enjoying their nights or enjoying their weekends. Uh, and that wasn't it for me. It was just like, I got to do this. I got to graduate. I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, all this stuff is going on, but I'm not going to go to medical. Um, so it, it got to that point where I'm like, is is this going to hold me back? Is this going to prevent me from being able to graduate from the course? Um, being in the military, we, we see often that that requirements get waived. And sometimes like I, I did well in everything else, maybe this will be one of those things. And uh, as we get closer, gear turn in day comes and no one's telling any telling me anything. I don't know if I'm going to graduate. Everybody's happy celebrating, um, getting ready for our mess night. Uh, Everybody's turning in their gear. I'm waiting for the word. Do I get to turn in my gear? Uh, are they just going to say, hey, uh, do better next time, but you can continue on? Um, I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and then it comes time to, I was going to have my parents fly out from Washington State to Quantico to be with us. I was going to fly the kids out, the wife out, everybody was going to come see me graduate. 
but I didn't know if it was going to happen. And I didn't want to have that conversation with them that, hey, I may not graduate. Um, but I had gotten to such a low place mentally and emotionally and just not knowing what was going on where I'm like, I got to have them come out regardless. If I don't graduate, I got to suck it up. Like if I, if, if my peers leave me, uh, that's okay. I, I just need to be around my family. Um, and what I didn't add is, is the grandfather that I spoke about uh, that was in the Air Force. He, uh, he passed away while I was at, while, while I was in Quantico. I was fortunate enough uh, to be able to go and see him for, for a few days uh, before he passed back in Arizona. Um, a, a needed break, but obviously not the best of circumstances, but happy looking back that I got, I got to see him. Um, but yeah, uh, family ends up coming out and uh, they give me the option the, the day after my family arrives, like, hey, this was uh, on rehearsal day for graduation. They say, hey, um, we'll give you a chance to, to do the hike. 15 miles, five hours is your, is your time limit. Um, so I, I took it and uh, I think I got up at three or four. I don't remember what time it was. And uh, I had to make a deal with them, uh, safety requirements, whatever it may be, like every, what was it, Tyler? Every three miles, you gotta take a break, like a 10 minute break or something. Yeah, typically walk for 50 minutes, take a 10 minute break, walk for 50 minutes, take a 10 minute break. Okay. So, yeah, uh, I said, hey, if you make me stop for full, for 10 minutes, like, I'm not going to make it. Um, I was like, do I have to stop? That, that was it. I was like, I could go all day. I just, I just can't go as fast as you want me to. Uh, they ended up saying, you got to stop, but we won't make you wait the 10 minutes. And uh, it was because of those shortened breaks of me going through the actions, taking off the Kevlar, uh, taking off all the gear, setting it down, taking a sip of water, and then throwing it all back on and, and moving on. Um, and uh, I passed. And uh, as soon as I got back uh, to the barracks, um, I'm like, can I go turn in my gear? And uh, they're like, yeah. And I was up on the second deck and uh, I ran up there. I'm like, can I go turn it in right now? And uh, I ran up and as I'm taking it off, uh, everything just hit and my body is just like falling apart at that time. But I, but I felt good. Uh, I ran, I got driven. Uh, I went and uh, turned in the gear, met up with uh, the rest of the company at graduation practice and I'm hobbling across the stage and uh, everybody who knew me and what was going on, I can remember them cheering for me. And I just remember just being completely elated and happy that this was happening. The family's there. Uh, I get to leave Quantico. Um, and move on. Um, you weren't diagnosed at this time, though, Wes. Like you had no idea. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, and that's that, that's on me. And I'll, I'll real quick get into that, just so I'm not taking up too much time. But uh, this whole time, I'm telling you, when my wife was gone, nobody knew what I what normal was for me. Nobody knew what I, I was supposed to look like and uh, where I was at physically. Like I, I wasn't with people who knew me. Um, Nobody was telling me, but every time I spoke with her, she's like, go to medical, go to medical. I'm like, no, nah, I'm okay. I'm okay. I had a, a this, probably the worst of it was a, a chronic cough where I was just coughing all the time without kind of like having the hiccups. And I didn't know where it was coming from. It was just more than anything. It was annoying and uh, distracting. And uh, I remember sitting in my truck sometimes and, and I turned the, the air on in the car and I would gag from the vents just blowing air into me, it would make me gag and I would be thrown up easily and just all this stuff. I had what's called true night sweats uh, in my bed. It was in the winter, snow outside. And so I thought my roommate uh, was just turning up the heat too high at night. And I was soaking my sheets, soaking my clothes. And I'm just like, I've never sweated this much before. So I would have to, I'd have to go take a shower just to, just to feel right. I'd have to change the, the sheets and everything in the middle of the night. It was more annoying than anything, but I was, I was dumb looking back. I, I didn't, I never looked anything up, but uh, my wife did. Uh, and had she been there with me, we'd have a very different story. Uh, there's no way I would have finished the course. There's no way I would have continued on my career. Um, but just fast forwarding through all that, graduated from the course, went back home to Washington State to get the house ready. Uh, I'm sick, sick. And uh, she's like, go to the hospital, go to the hospital. And I'm like, no, I need to get the house ready to, to move to Florida. We're gonna go, I'm going to go do some flight training. Just 
let me get to Florida first. And uh, we were fighting about it, about me needing to go. I'm like, I got too much stuff to, to worry about. Let's get there, then I'll go. Uh, so I went, I ended up going because the wife is always going to win that battle eventually. Um, I went, uh, they said maybe it was walking pneumonia, they gave me a, a Z pack for everyone who's familiar. Uh, come back if it doesn't work. It didn't work, but I'm like, I got to go to Florida. So same thing, went to Florida. Uh, Stu, I mentioned this in our call. Um, out of the, the 10 of us that went to uh, medical to, to get our up chips to begin flight training, um, when you're given the option to say yes or no to all these different conditions in your history, it was no, 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 no. Uh, I'm, I'm good, 100% ready to go, let's do it. And uh, so I was the first one to get my up chip. Nothing came up. And uh, so I'm very proud of that moment. Um, but uh, yeah, part of the flight training. Navy, Navy medical. <laughs> Maybe medical. That's good. <laughs> um, started started flight training, uh, IFS, uh, for anyone who's familiar. Did not get that far. Uh, my breaking point was uh, I was cutting uh, cutting the grass one day. We were living up in Pace, Florida. Um, I had it in my mind that I wanted to fly helicopters. So I, I centrally located myself between Pensacola and Whiting Field uh, up in Pace, Florida. That was the plan. I'm going to go fly Cobras. Uh, ultimately is what I wanted. But uh, yeah, uh, that didn't happen. I, I, like I said, I was mowing the grass one day, uh, about passed out and uh, came back in. And I just remember shaking and shivering uncontrollably um, and just like begging my wife to, to cover me up, to come and hug me and hold me and provide me heat. And I, I felt ridiculous, but I just, I couldn't do anything about it. And at that point, she was so fed up with me she wouldn't do it she wouldn't hug me she's just like no i already told you um and a week before that um or about a week before that uh we had just found out that we were expecting child number three and uh so uh, emotions were high uh but needless to say i i ended up going into medical um they gave me a blood test uh for a whole blood cell count or excuse me a cbc a complete blood cell count and uh left I, I got a frantic phone call that afternoon from a doctor at the, the naval hospital um telling me that i had the highest white, white blood cell count that she had ever seen and it wasn't somebody that that i had met with um if i could backtrack a little bit uh the doctor that i did meet with um I went in telling my wife had looked stuff up um, and she said, all the signs and symptoms you have, it looks like you have tuberculosis. And I'm like, it's not that, but uh, I went to medical. Uh, the doctor wasn't available to, to see me during sick call hours. Um, so, so I met with a, an HM2, uh, an E5. And uh, I had to say, I think I have tuberculosis. Yeah, I didn't think that, but uh that's what prompted him to go grab the doctor. Doctor came, looked at me, uh, he wanted to run all these tests. He thought, uh, I'll just give you a stronger, whatever's stronger than a Z pack to, to help you, like whatever the sickness is, we'll, we'll help you battle it. Um, and, and we'll do a blood test. I said, okay. So did the blood test and then it came back. Highest white blood cell count they've ever seen, 383,000. Uh, a normal white blood cell count is 4,000 to 11,000. Uh, so anybody familiar with white blood cells, uh, are, are meant to fight off infections. So they spike up when you're fighting infections. And when I got tested, it was 383,000. And I said, no, nah, that's, that's gotta be a mistake. Like that's just, that's a ridiculous number. I don't know anything, but that's just, that's a ridiculous number. If you're telling me that that is normal. Um, and I'm coughing still at this point. And uh, the doctor on the other line is freaking out. And she's like, do you need an ambulance? You need to go to an emergency room right away. And I'm laughing. I'm like, no, I'm okay. I'll take myself. I'll go and get checked. And, and to be completely honest, I, I thought, I thought I was a joke was being played on me, a, a, a cruel joke. Cause maybe the, the first doctor I met with thought I was exaggerating my symptoms. And he, he, he called on his buddy to, to make me feel bad or something. That that's where my mind was. And uh, my wife is freaking out, but I go to the hospital get diagnosed with with chronic myeloid leukemia um my immediate question is what do well 
what do I have to do? Uh, well, chemo, radiation, all that stuff. And I'm like, well, what if I don't do that? I can fight it off. I'm young. Uh, and very matter of factly, um, he said, you're going to die. And uh, the part that hit me with that was, was not so much, I'm going to die. Like, it didn't make sense. Um, but, but we just found out we were having a kid. So my, my thoughts went immediately, or that we were having and going to have another kid. My thoughts immediately went to my wife and, and my two soon to be three kids and, and needing a father. Um, it was them. I, I can't leave them. They need me. So I'll do whatever it takes. You tell me I need to do all this stuff. And so, uh, I got admitted. I was there, uh, for a good while. I uh, got the numbers down and uh, just fast forward to today. Um, it's just something that I'm living with. I, I take uh, medication for it every day. And, and as with anything of this type of, of drug, uh, there's side effects. I have good days, down days, uh, but it, it teaches you to, to fully embrace the good days. And uh, when I'm having a good day, like I'm out there PTN as much as I can and and I pay for it later, but I tell myself, I'm young, uh, I see a lot of people a lot worse off, I'm like I can do it now. Maybe someday I won't be able to, but uh, until that time comes, I'm, I'm gonna keep pushing. Um, and, and dealing with this thing in the military, um, obviously medical retirement is there, but I wasn't ready for it, I'm not ready for it. I got three more years until regular retirement, that's the goal, um, but until that, time comes, like, I'm, I'm going to keep pushing it and doing everything I can to, to bring my boys up into to being good men and good people and uh, making sure that they're taken care of uh, when I'm not here. And uh, that is my why and, and why I do what I do. And that's awesome. I, I think what really strikes me is obviously what a crazy story and just hard as nails to... <laughs> I finished TBS with leukemia. I don't think that's a very common uh, discriminator, but but I think um, you know people when they're faced with this kind of challenge, significant challenge, they can. There's two paths they can take, and I think the people that, that have a strong why and they've really dedicated themselves to that are, are able to achieve things that one nobody thinks they can. But it's also you're continuously driving, right? You're not feeling sorry for yourself. You could easily, you know kind of look internally, focus internally and, and, but that would not honor who you are and, and the why that you've clearly established uh, for yourself, for your family. And so thank you for sharing that, dude. That's, that's, um, that's awesome. It's powerful. And, and I think, I think it also really highlights the power of having a strong why. I think it really shows the, the listeners that, you know, if you didn't have that, I just don't know. I don't know if you'd be as, I mean, you look, like you look super young. It's crazy. I, I, I thought you were like a, a young uh, junior officer, you know, a couple of years into the service, but, um, but there's, I'm highly encouraged by, by how you've taken that why and just turned into action and, and turned into life. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible. Thank you. It's good stuff, man. James over to you, friend, what you got, oh, what you got. Yeah. Can you follow that? Wes, I mean, so Wes is part of uh, my group in that mastermind. Um, so I, I will echo what Stu said earlier, but, but yeah, that, that's, that's an incredible story. Um, I didn't know it to that detail either. So I really appreciate the sharing of, of a lot of that and, and how vulnerable it is, how vulnerable you are right now to, to be able to, to talk about that is awesome. It's very encouraging for many other men and women out there. So you got to keep telling that brother, you got to. You got to, it's encouraging. It's awesome. It's, it's great to hear. Um, so the, uh, <laughs> so for me, um, my why, um, is, a, has been a bit all over the place. Um, I, I will say that, that my theory behind finding a why is that you can slip in and out of your why quite easily in life. Um, I think that why can change. You can chase it if you know where it is. Um, but, but you can also lose it pretty easily. Uh, so recently with my kids, we were watching the, the movie Klaus. If you haven't seen that yet, it's a good one. 
Uh, I think both boys and girls will, will enjoy it. So I, like, I know all the songs from Frozen. I know Stu does. But Wes, with four boys, I don't know that you know all the songs from Frozen. Maybe no. you do. But Number um, four is obsessed. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Hey, so is Stu. <laughs> Dude, I love Frozen. I love it. Oh, the, um, there's a there's a quote in Klaus, and I actually wrote it down because I was floored, right? I'm, I'm watching this animation with my kids, and, 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 and there's a quote, and I wrote it down here. A true selfless act always sparks another. And I was like, man, that's deep. That's a good. true selfless act always sparks another. And so at first, I started to think about that a little bit, like internalize it. I'm like, that's kind of cool. You can start this external chain reaction. Like if you do something nice, that will encourage other people to do something nice. And then that just perpetuates forever, which is awesome. But more recently, I was like, you can internalize that too. So a little bit what Tyler alluded to earlier about getting up at five in the morning or 4.30 in the morning or Stu's brain turning on at 3.30 in the morning and people getting behind you and championing you. If you're doing selfless acts internally, it also perpetuates internally within you. So it gives you energy. It allows you to wake up early. It allows you to do more. It takes something that could be heavy lifting for most and it could lighten that load. So that quote, I thought is great to share with the world. I hope that it starts a chain reaction amongst a bunch of people, but also internally, it can take one act and all of a sudden you're doing five acts a day and you're doing 10 acts a day. And then all of a sudden your mind is just constantly thinking about this selfless nature. And then you're selfishly selfless, which is crazy to think, but like you're selfish about being selfless. And so that's a big part of what is starting to drive me and it hasn't been what has always driven me. So as I go through this evolution of a why of it, I was forced to write it down, which is actually part of, of kind of my theory behind why. So if people are willing to entertain it, I will get into it real quick. But Let's do it, man. life Love in it. general can be broken down into two different things. As simple as I can make it. I'm a simple Tim. I'm in the Air Force. You guys know I have to keep things simple. But Things can either give you energy or they can drain you of energy. Doesn't matter what you're doing, how often you're doing it, it either gives you energy or it takes it away. It's that simple. And if something, you can find something that gives you energy, you are on your journey towards your why. That is the first step for me. The evolution is finding a why. You have to find it. You're out there. So I think back from when I was younger and I was a knucklehead and I was trying to find my why. I didn't know what I was looking for. I didn't even really care what it was. Could have been money when I was uh, working for a large company in a very large financial district, just chasing uh, status and making it as much as I could. Like maybe that was my why. I had no idea, but I was just out there chasing, 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 chasing. So some of the things behind that is like, you're naive, you're exploring, you're trying to figure out the world, but you, you are actively finding something that's driving you, right? So you are finding your why, you're trying to find your why, but eventually you're forced to define your why. So that's stage two for me. You transition from finding a why to defining a why. And defining a why is extremely hard. It is so difficult when somebody asks you on the phone or in person, like, why are you doing this? Like, what is your motivation? Or even worse, when they think that your motivation is off or that they, you're only doing that because so-and-so or because such and such. And that's what's tough is that you're like, no, this is purely selfless. And defining your why is frustrating. It's really hard to do. And I think people struggle with it. I struggle with it. It was very difficult to write down on a sheet of paper what my why is and my why defining it is to just positively contribute every day, every day. Sometimes that means I have to be present with my kids and my wife. And when they wanna go out in the snow before we have dinner for 20 minutes and I wanna sit down and try to like gather my thoughts for a podcast, I have to put on the second pair of socks today 
and fight with them to get their snowshoes on and go out front and have a blast. But I just want to positively contribute. And it means every day positively contribute. So my mind is there. It's defined. I know that I need to do it. it it's my compass. It's my guide. So that's where I, I kind of, my mantra every day is just positively contribute. The great part beyond that, and this is where I think, Tyler, you're definitely in it. Wes has experienced it. I think life defined Wes's why based on what we just heard. So his was actually like said, here's your why, brother. It's been defined for you. But you move into this refining your why. And so Storehouse 310, like look at the men and women you guys are attracting now. Because you guys have refined your why. You found it, you defined it, and now you're refining it. And refining it is fun. Look at the people you attract. It's so cool how it's just people are calling you now. They're asking for advice. I know that I have personally done that. It's exciting to be around you. You're attracting a certain tribe of people. You are doing that selfless act that's sparking another because you guys are refining your why right now. And so that's where I hope and I encourage most people to get to where they can start refining your why. That old man on the front porch in the rocking chair that you just want to sit down and talk to because he's been refining his why for decades and he can just point you in the right direction, say it with passion, get you encouraged, get yourself off the floor and moving in the right direction. That's the beauty of all of this is to get into that third phase, refining your why. So with my kind of most recent refining of the why is with a uh, the Jolly 2-2 call sign, the Jolly 2-2 crew was a, was a crew that my unit lost in 2014, early 2014. So on January 7th, 2014, Jolly 2-2 went down uh, just on the northern coast of England and we lost uh, four members. So three brothers and one sister uh, to my unit. And uh, we're, we're approaching the seventh year anniversary of this. Now, last year, we talked about it a little bit. My unit, like, obviously was familiar with Jolly 2-2 and the story, but it took somebody outside of our unit to actually champion and, and put together an, an actual memorial for them. And we've relocated. So we used to fly in England. We now fly in Italy. But that Jolly 2-2, the Jolly Spirit, was left in England. And there were other people there, RAF members, um, civilians that worked on base, who said that that sound of our Pavehawk helicopter, when it left, like part of, part of that community left with it. They were used to hearing that sound. And so one in particular started to ruck and he didn't really have a goal in mind. He just wanted to ruck and give back. And so he created a, a little fundraiser page and he started walking and he's a beast. This guy put 57 pounds on his back and he rucked 56 miles in one week and at a decent pace too. I mean, this guy was moving. So he was telling us his story and this is last year. This is all happening last year. And so we're catching wind of it in our unit. Here's some guy that's not even in our unit who's like picked up this Jolly 2-2 torch and said, hey, literally put the weight on my back. I got this. Let me carry it forward for you. And it was embarrassing for me. I was like, why are we not doing that? Why are we relying on somebody else who's refining his why right now and taking it out there and doing something great? So um, I was angry. Uh, I was, it was quick to blame everyone else. You know, there's leaders in the squadron should be doing this. Why aren't we, we actually remembering it? And uh, most recently within the last few weeks, a lot of those things resurfaced because we're getting close to the anniversary again. And, and I could feel the anger. And I was in the bathroom getting ready for work. And I looked up and I saw myself. And when I was angry at everyone else, I was really angry at myself. Like, James, this is you. Take it, run with this, put it together. Let's go. That person that you want to blame is really yourself right now. So. Um, we have since re-energized that arm in England with a bunch of guys that want to ruck. We have re-energized that arm down in Italy with the unit. 
we have um, gotten in contact with the aircraft commander, Sean Ruain. Uh, he has a foundation in his name. And so we got in contact with the board of the Sean Ruain org and they, or the Sean Ruain foundation, excuse me, and said, hey, how can we help you guys? Can we do this? Can we move forward? Um, and, and I will say it was very humbling to speak to them because the board is, is made up of a number of great individuals, uh, most of which, well, his parents are on the board, but a lot of his friends that have known him his entire life, to include his best man at his wedding. Uh, so it was a very humbling talk. It was a very humbling experience just to, to meet them for the first time. And um, one of them made the comment that this year in particular has been tough with COVID. They've had to cancel both of their main events. They, they do like a cornhole tournament and then they do a, a golf tournament. And COVID has stopped that for them. And they didn't quite know what to do. Um, they're actually giving away still whatever they can. 750% of what they, they brought in this year, they're giving it away because they saved it from previous years. But they, they said that email that they got from us down here saying we want to do this was timed perfectly because they didn't know what they were going to actually be able to put together. So we created a t-shirt. It's caught on fire across our rescue community. Um, we're, we're raising a decent amount of money from that. We have a Facebook page that, that people can donate to. And then we have donations going directly to the foundation right now. And we set a goal. We're raising $22,000. So that was just, it made sense. It's spreading like fire. We've moved into quickly defining the why and refining the why. And we can just see it. We can just see everybody getting involved and stuff like that. So that's kind of like a shortened version of how you can lose your why and then have to re, sorry, find it again, define it, and then start to refine it. So um, that that's just a snippet, I think, of where I've gone with a, many facets of my life. Uh, but it is constant. It's a constant battle of staying in your defined why and moving forward. So that's all I got, gents. Appreciate you listening. Man, you guys freaking fire me up, dude. I'm really? uh, first off, thank you for the kind words to uh, Storehouse. I, was, I felt myself like starting to. I'm like, I'm not gonna cry on YouTube with all these freaking <laughs> beasts on. It's but been, uh, it's been done before, so you know. It, yeah, we. It's true. We have. We have. Uh, mostly not an Army though. Navy day. Not an Army. Yeah, yeah you can't cry on Army <laughs> Navy right. until you win. Absolutely um but but i will say that that you know that's awesome i love the way you broke that down and there's a couple things so we have a couple marines on so the fact that you made it so simple i think they're very huge. appreciative right yep. it's huge i, I right? really really appreciate that thank you yeah. had there been a picture i think i would have been able to follow a little better but that's, that's true, that's true. true. <laughs> i missed my whiteboard i, I need my whiteboard. That's right. you did some crayons on your screen uh <laughs> you know it would have been it would have been money but um no but i think you know simplifying it like that makes it easy to to action and then the fact that you the way you broke down the why and and you know the steps uh, behind a why from from taking it from uh, conceptual to action and i love all that dude that that was that was awesome and i and i think i think our listeners are gonna just get a ton of value from everything you guys are saying and before you know we're kind of getting close i know i don't want to uh i could keep you guys on for hours but but I, I just think that you rewind these parts and listen to to how these men have have gotten to where they are with their why and, and how that's driven action and the different ways. But right, you guys' causes are are vastly different. They're varied, but but they're they're all powerful and, and it's it's an outward focus, uh, which makes the most powerful why. And I think you guys have highlighted that in an amazing way. Um, so that that's awesome man thank you for sharing james and and i don't want to go tyler i want to go back to you real quick to highlight um you know talk a little bit about the you know the what exactly it is your your mother-in-law is doing and why you guys are are passionate about that if you don't mind yeah i really appreciate it so unbound now what they are they're an international inter or organization that fights human trafficking. So they have offices, um, a lot of them are in Texas, some California, and then in Mongolia and Cambodia and those kind of places. And what was really crazy to me is 
I didn't realize how streamlined and how efficient nonprofits can be with their resources. So for guys like us, right, we're like, say I do a house flip and I make 50 grand on it. I tie out of my income anyways, right? Um, I'm, a, I'm a Christian guy too, as well, like the upfront, bottom line upfront. Um, so that drives pretty much everything we're doing. And the tithe off of, uh, David, we might, do you need to get a calculator out, but if 50 grand, what's the tithe on a 50 grand, 10%? Like, like $7,300 or something like that? Yeah, it's it's close. Like close. close. It, it's five, five grand, right? So five grand, that's an awesome amount of money. So close. And I think in this world where there's so many um, people donating money to big causes, you hear about so-and-so given a hundred, hundred thousand dollars to X, Y, or Z, and they're super rich. And you're like, wow, that guy, that's awesome. That guy made a huge difference. He's able to give a hundred grand. Like I could give five grand, I guess that would be maybe a drop in the bucket, but with unbound now five grand employs a worker in Mongolia, who's sitting on the border 365 days a year and snatching people off trains, off of caravans, off buses, and saving them from being sold into slavery. And so it's like, holy cow, when I heard that, it like gave me, I just got goosebumps. It's like, if that's the amount of money that it takes to employ just one person, I was like, man, I gotta know more about this. And $30,000 employs their whole Mongolia branch. And so alluding back to what I was talking about beforehand, it's like, okay, 120 grand worth of passive income from five different or from 10 different houses, like we're all in the real estate world. Like we know people that have like 200 units, like it's not out of the realm of possibility in my mind to use real estate to fund nonprofits like that, that are making such a big difference with that amount of money. And like my wife has experienced it personally. She's been out to lunch with my mother-in-law and she'll get a call from the sheriff um, unbound. Now they partner with the law enforcement and they do like hard hit stings, like kick down the door, police go in, arrest the pimps, arrest the whoever's like trafficking these women or men and unbound comes in the second, second in the stack, as we say in like the infantry. Right. So they're, they're coming in next to go care for the victims. And my mother-in-law got a call while she was with my, uh, my wife and they're like, hey, we've got a victim that we just got. Can you guys come and get her? Um, we need we need some help. And so my wife's experienced it firsthand as far as seeing somebody who has been exposed to that and seeing how Unbound Now is able to care for those people. And they've got some just super exciting stuff. It would take too long to go into it, but they've got like a drop-in center. They're They're doing some really, really big things. And for me, it's just like what I first let off with, it's like, I've been blessed so much with so many different things. I think it'd be criminal to not press super deep into a why that is meaningful yeah. and, and use that to really further the kingdom and take care of people. Right. It's awesome, dude. Love uh, it. You know, that is, I mean, it's just, that's it, rad. You know, one of the things that, that we were talking about before Stu is highlighting uh, that sermon we were listening to um, that we're going to push out to you guys and put in the show notes. One of the things he highlights that you just really touched on, all of you have touched on it is, is he highlights that we live in the richest generation in the history of the world, that there is more resource available at, at, to give than there has ever been. And he highlights bringing up, men and women who are willing to be warriors and to and to actually make a difference with all that wealth that we have and, and not be so focused on on filling your you know the barns and being sec secure but to the outward pouring of that to really impact the world because can you imagine if every business hypothetically every business in the world gave a tithe exactly like exactly. it would be it would be crazy it would be crazy and the, the what it could do is make such a big a big difference and that's what Stu and I are super passionate about and our why is as you highlighted James is changing significantly because now we're looking at ways that um, how to create challenges and how to create um, you know thinking really big thoughts on how to create this environment where we're recruiting people bringing them in 
and seeing who can outgive each other through their businesses, right? Like, well, hey, hey man, I gave I gave 35% last year. What'd you do? You did 40? What? Okay. Well, I guess I got up the ante. And 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 making that into something that's very viable, but also showing that the direct impacts, right? Because I think it's possible. And it's just your tribe and who you surround yourself with and how you set that up, I think is, is super important. So and you guys are awesome. You guys got me fired up. Speaking of, uh, speaking of challenges, I think James uh, challenges to do a bunch of burpees for the next like, right. 22 days. Right. Yeah. That's right. I'm a little nervous. Yeah. About it. I need to go do some burpees right now. I gotta, I gotta get this energy out. Right. <laughs> no right. Yeah. Second we'll, in, we'll the stack. in the snow. Yeah. Go get it in the <laughs> snow, man. Hey, so one point of clarification when you say so it annoys me when I do workouts with people and we do burpees, you consider a burpee, you get down, you go down, chest to the ground and pop back up, right? <laughs> He's going to do it for us. No, yeah, I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I would. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can't stand it when people down. go down and they, they stay up and bring their legs in and back out. That's not a burpee, dude. It's not. A, no. I'm sorry. If all, for the listeners out there that think that's a burpee, it's not a burpee. All the way down. If you got some rings too that you can hold, like if you all the way down, jump up, Ooh. grab the rings if you need to, you know, oh, get dang. in there. So, oh, dang. Um, well, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna do uh, what is it, 22,000 burpees in 22? Yeah, days? so, so my team is uh, my team is growing still, but we're gonna do 22,000 burpees in 22 days. So, we start December 17th and then we go to the anniversary of the crash, which is January 7th. Um, 22,000 burpees of my team. You know, the team's growing so fast that we might have to split it into multiple teams. Um, there's one rule. You have to find a sponsor that's willing to donate a penny for every burpee that the team completes up to 22000 So once again, calculators out, that's a $220 donation. So you find a sponsor that's going to give $220 to our cause to be on this team to complete all these burpees. And it's you're going to go through Christmas. Oh, it's going to be beautiful. You're going to have to like put down the dinner. Be like, I got 15 more burpees and I got burpees. Real quick. Mm. Yeah, kids are gonna be crawling on your back, Wes. You know, like it's gonna be great. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's good. All right, so let, let's just let's just throw this challenge out now to like most of uh to all of the war room. Um, if anyone's listening to this, uh, let's let's just do some burpees. How about it? Yeah, I hate it. burpees. Oh, they're the worst. <laughs> they're, the so worst but they're so Especially good. Especially a hundred of them every day oh. for 22 days. Tyler, oh. just wear all white. You'll look like I know. I would, <laughs> yeah. like I'm lightning. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> I kid, I kid you not. My coaches they caught on to me at the end of my my time there, and by then it was like all bets were off. They knew exactly who I was, uh, and they're like, "Go, go! Why are you still wearing those white gloves from sophomore year?" <laughs> and I just was honest. I said, "Coach, like, I need you to think I'm faster than I am. I'm just <laughs> that's what it is." So. Uh, did it did it work no uh, <laughs> no i would i played special teams and backed up my uh, whole career but that's so good i looked i looked fast doing it on film at that's least so practice. Good. i love that's it awesome man. i love it oh man well guys uh this has been i think this is my favorite episode so far i, I uh i'm thoroughly fired up to like go like take over the world right now so uh, I appreciate every single one of you. Um, I am incredibly thankful uh, and I feel blessed to have you guys uh, in our network and, and call you friends. Um, and uh, and man, I'm, I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I'm fired up. So yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Hey, you guys are uh, just an encouragement to each of you. You guys are definitely influencers. Your, your game changers, the things that you guys are doing, your legacies, your why, everything that you're building, what you're sharing to our listeners right now, man, I, I'm, I'm just so humbled to, to share the, to share the screen with you. And, um, uh, and just so grateful that you guys took the time to, to meet with a couple of knuckleheads like Stu and I more knuckleheadish for Stu, but, um, but you know, I'm not far behind him. So hey, man, thank you guys I, for that. I'm the one that gets like all the five-star reviews and you're so dumb, dude. You're so dumb. All right. Well, That's I'd it. ask That's once again true. that everyone go and give me five star reviews, David one star reviews, James Tyler and Wes oh. like ten star reviews. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, hey, seriously, uh, um, we're gonna post all all, all of these uh, you know organizations in in the um, uh, the show notes. Check them out. Uh, support these guys. Support these causes. Um, find your own why. Redefine it. 
um and let's let's like go make some difference in this world yeah, what do buddy. you think all right and uh, like it most important go fill your storehouse make it a great day friends see you see you